Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. We are going to be continuing our discussion from last week. Last week, we were talking about the mother goddess Asherah that archaeological records show was likely worshipped alongside Yahweh. And we talked about why this is important. Many of us were taught that there was a monotheistic male god or at least a god that likes to go by male pronouns, that created man, then created woman from man's rib to be a helpmeet to man, and that she was more susceptible to evil and therefore was to be ruled over by man forevermore. And because we were taught that that's the way it had always been from the very foundations of the earth, It's so important for us to understand that that is a made-up construct. That actually Mother Goddess was the first god. Ishtar was the first recorded goddess, the first recorded god at all, the first recorded deity to be worshipped by humans. And then we start seeing a pantheon of gods where there are gods and goddesses being worshipped. And then around 600 BCE, we see, at least in the Abrahamic religions, we see a divorce between Yahweh, the male god, or the god that uses male pronouns, and Asherah, the mother goddess. And as Israelites are writing down their religious histories while they are exiled in Babylon. Patriarchal ideas that were already circulating and had been circulating for hundreds, if not thousands of years, began to be put and codified into religious texts. As we're talking about this, I want you to really allow yourself to stop and imagine what it would be like to be an Israelite who is exiled. What would that be like? Imagine with me for a moment that a different country that has a different religion and a different culture and a different language conquered your country, forcibly exiled you to go live in their country, to worship the way they do, to eat their food, to speak their language. Imagine how confusing and traumatizing it would be to not know how your family is doing, if your family's alive, where they live, to have those relationships just change overnight. Imagine the grief and the trauma that would bring up for you. Imagine your sense of identity really going up in smoke. Most of us listening to this podcast, we know what that's like. We know what it's like when we have begun to question religion or we've left our religion and what that does to our identity. Now imagine that that wasn't a choice you made. That wasn't something you got to make the decisions about, but you were forcibly ripped from the place where your religion was practiced, and dropped in another country where it was not okay for you to practice your religion, where the symbols of your religion had been destroyed, your temple 
had been razed to the ground. Had been so utterly destroyed there is nothing left. Imagine likely being treated as a second-class citizen, a conquered person, being treated as less than. I know some of you listening to this, you know what that feels like. You've experienced that here in the United States or over in Europe. You know what it feels like to be a minority. You know what it feels like to be marginalized. You know what that trauma feels like. This is a whole people experiencing that. And it is in this atmosphere where Israelites are seeking an identity and Yahweh is the God that is different from all the other cultures around them. It is in a place of patriarchy. If you look at the Code of Hammurabi, that came from the Babylonian Empire. It's highly patriarchal, and you have these Israelites being dispersed, where, you know, patriarchy was already prominent in Israelite society, but becomes even more prominent in Israelite society. They're being taught deeply patriarchal ideas. You can see those echoed in the Old Testament. And it's in this deeply rooted patriarchal space with a traumatized people who are trying to hang on to a sense of identity that we have the Old Testament written. And it is in this atmosphere that we have the divorce of Yahweh from Asherah. And I think what really strikes me about understanding that it is a traumatized people that are writing this history allows me to see the dysfunction and the misogyny, the sexism, the patriarchy, the some of the really messed up ideas about the world and how it works. It allows me to see it through the lens of these people were trying to survive. And they were trying to make sense out of tragedy. And they were trying to regain a sense of self. And so as we're talking about the divorce of Yahweh from Asherah, I think often there is, at least for me, the way I see it is there's this idea that somewhere along the way, Men in power decided to subvert women, and I don't think that's how this happened. I actually think that men and women made choices for survival that ended up giving men a lot more free time to learn to write and to read and to tell their stories and to associate with other men and to write laws and to create the framework for society while women were at home caring for endless pregnancies and small children and were so busy with that work that my guess is they didn't even realize their rights were being stripped away until those rights had been stripped away for so long that they forgot they had rights in the first place. When I think about these ancient people, I think about my early marriage, and I think about my husband in the military, and I think about having two small children, and how completely consuming having two small kids was while my husband was in the military. Yes, he was deployed. He was fighting in a war zone. And yet, during that same time, I was averaging maybe two showers a week because I was so busy with little kids and with educating them and taking them to activities and like just pouring attention and time into them and making sure that, you know, they got the mom time that they needed and the the strong attachments that they needed to feel safe in this world. 
I was waking up with them in the middle of the night. I was taking care of them when they were sick. I was, you know, helping them when they were emotionally overwhelmed. And it was an all day long, every day, every month, all year long process. I rarely got to eat by myself. Showering was a luxury. Getting to use the bathroom without little hands coming underneath the doors, like, hardly ever happened. And yes, my husband was doing hard work and was away from home, and it was emotionally and mentally taxing, and he still had time to play video games. He still had time to earn a master's degree. He still had time to read several books for pleasure. That's what I'm talking about here. This is what's going on. Both men and women were working very hard, but women, their job was all consuming. There was no time for me to read books aside from like Dr. Seuss to my kids or, you know, Good Night Moon. And yet my husband was earning a master's degree and reading books for fun, playing video games and getting to spend time with other men having conversations that did not revolve around diapers. And this is the environment in which books that we still draw from are being written. And I just think it's so important for us to remember that it is imperfect people, particularly traumatized imperfect people, writing these books. At least from my point of view, it's... It's not coming directly from God. It's not being written at the time of creation. It is men doing their best, I'm sure, to make sense of the world, to communicate what they believe the divine is, to try to write down their culture and preserve it for the children to make sense of the world. So with that in mind, I'd like us to go into the divorce of Yahweh from Asherah. Now I have a quick ask of you. As we dig into this topic, I want your thoughts and opinions. Like I said, this is our best guess at what's going on according to what artifacts historians have found, according to what written documents there are, the art of the time comparing other cultures that are in near vicinities. I want to hear, though, what you think is going on. What do you think this means? Why do you think this is important? Or do you think it's important? I think really having conversations about this is what changes things. And that's part of the reason we're having this conversation. So please head over to the Emancipate Yourself Facebook group, We're going to be talking about what does this mean? Does it make any difference today? Does the fact that we consider a book that was written or at least began to be written 2,600 years ago and we consider it infallible, that we consider it God's word, that we look to structure our society today in 2022 after what was happening in 600 BC, does that make sense to you? Or does that not make sense to you? I mean, personally, when I think about medicine, for instance, would we ever use 2,600-year-old documents and best practices for medicine today? Would we ever give the same marriage advice that was given back 2,600 years ago for a healthy marriage today? Would we use any of the like law practices? Would we still chop off arms and gouge out people's eyes like they did 2,600 years ago? Are these documents written by traumatized people who had just undergone a huge loss and are likely undergoing a huge identity crisis? Do we really want to take their words and live by them without questioning them? Is that in the best interest of our emotional, mental, and societal health today? Just questions. So please head over there. I want to hear what you have to say. 
Okay. Before we get into the very beginning of Genesis, because we're going to revisit the Garden of Eden story and we're going to talk about this very blatant divorce once we know what the symbols for Asherah are, I want to talk about the symbols. There were three main symbols and they usually showed up together in the mythology. So there were sacred trees, there were serpents, and there was usually a figure of a goddess herself that kind of formed a divine trinity. You would usually see these things together, a tree, serpent, and a goddess. They had significantly overlapping and interchangeable symbolism, and they were often depicted together. And we see all three of these symbols in the creation story, in the Garden of Eden. And I want to talk about this because these symbols are intentional. They're not there on accident. And the way they're used really does create a divorce of Yahweh from Asherah. So first, sacred trees were thought to be the conduit to the divine. Because they went down and their roots went down into the earth, the ancient peoples thought that was connected to the netherworld. Then it came up through the mortal sphere where we live and then up into the heavens where the gods and goddesses lived. And it was considered a divine conduit from earth to heaven. And it was your way to communicate with and experience the divine. The other crazy thing is trees were imbued with something the ancients called serpent power. Because the trees would grow and change and shed their leaves and grow again, like a serpent would shed its skin and then grow again and renew, this symbolized the generation and regeneration of life. So it kind of symbolized eternal life, but also growth and knowledge and wisdom. So they were associated with the source of life, Mother Earth or the goddess, because the goddess was thought to create all life and to renew all life. So trees and serpents make a lot of sense in that context. Today, we think of serpents as bad things. We usually think of serpents as evil because of the Garden of Eden story, because the serpent was Satan. It was the devil. And Christianity has a huge influence on the world, especially in the Western world. A third of the population of the world is Christian or is influenced by Christianity. So this is a huge influential factor. And I want you to think about the fact that who creates a lot of the media that goes around the world? It comes from the West, right? A lot of our movies come from Western Europe. They come from the United States. And people all over the world watch these movies. So we have Western Christian values often being disseminated around the world. So these symbols subconsciously come to mean certain things for the entire world. Serpents have come to mean evil or Satan or like the dark forces. I was just watching Harry Potter and what is Lord Voldemort's pet? Najimi is a snake, a serpent, and Voldemort is the force of evil. So we've got a serpent and the force of evil kind of combined again in the Harry Potter series. And I'm sure J.K. Rowling probably didn't give a whole lot of conscious thought to the fact that she was continuing this idea that serpents are evil. It's this subconscious idea that I think is inside of a lot of us. We kind of perpetuate these ideas without realizing we're perpetuating them. Serpents, however, used to be the symbol of life, the symbol of rebirth, the symbol of eternal life and regeneration and growth, along with trees. And sacred trees would have been planted in special sanctuaries or gardens in Palestine and throughout Mesopotamia. These would have been known as high places, and they were places to commune with the divine feminine life force. So we call Mother Earth Mother Earth for a reason. She gives birth to all earth, 
the trees and the life cycle remind us that life has stages and seasons and that it is a regenerative process. And so all of this is found in the mythology of the Garden of Eden. So we have the symbolism of the sacred trees in the garden, which let's just talk about that first of all. The garden was the place where we planted the trees to go and worship the divine feminine. And so whose garden is it? It is God the Father that has planted the garden. This is not a garden to worship the divine feminine. God the Father plants the garden. God the Father puts all the plants in there. And it's not a place presided over by priestesses like it would have been back in ancient Israel. This is a place that is presided over by Adam, a man. So God the Father creates the garden, not the mother goddess, and places a man in the garden to tend it and take care of it. Then we have the tree of life, which was a symbol for Asherah, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was also a symbol for Asherah. And just the trees alone are both symbols of divine feminine. But in the story, the meaning is turned upside down. In this garden that Yahweh's created, he creates the trees, not the mother goddess. And then he tells Adam not to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is like Yahweh telling him not to venerate the goddess, lest he should surely die. So before this writing, you would go to the tree, you would perform your rituals and your rites, you would bake a honey cake for Asherah, you might bring fruit for Asherah. But here we're being told that going to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, going to the tree to speak to the divine goddess, is not okay, lest you surely die. Eating fruit from the tree would be like communing with the divine feminine, seeking knowledge from the divine feminine. This was considered evil and separated them from Yahweh. Any knowledge they wish to acquire must come through Yahweh himself. So in this myth, we're told this tree is evil. You shouldn't eat the fruit, meaning you shouldn't commune with the divine feminine. And if you do, you'll be separated from Yahweh. You'll surely die. And that if you want knowledge, you have to go to Yahweh. The tree of life is then taken as the symbol of Yahweh with his signature cherubim, the two cherubim with the flaming sword. So if you think about the Ark of the Covenant, it had two cherubim on the sides. And that's what we see in this mythology is we have Adam and Eve roaming. They're able to freely eat of all of the trees except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because if they get knowledge from the divine feminine, they'll be separated from Yahweh. They'll surely die. And he takes on the tree of life as his symbol by placing the two cherubim with the flaming swords there to guard that tree. Now let's talk about the symbolism of serpents. So in the ancient Near East, the serpent had both positive and negative connotations. And the Yahwehist, when I say the Yahwehist, they, they refer to this writer in the Old Testament as J. So there are three different sources, three different writing styles in the first five books of the Old Testament. And the Yahwehist, which is the person that wrote Genesis 2. So it is a different writing style in Genesis 1. And then in Genesis 2, we have who they refer to as J, the J material. And J is often called a Yahwehist. The Yahwehist like, has a deep feeling that Yahweh is the only legitimate God, has a deep hatred of Canaan and Canaanites, and often is discrediting Canaan. So the Yahwehist, or J, really played on the mythology of both, both the positive and the negative connotations of the serpent. So let's talk about that for a minute. Now, the positive connotations, 
The serpent represented the divine itself, responsible for creation, life, and rebirth, symbolized by the regular shedding of its skin. So snakes live in the earth, making it a natural association with Mother Earth. The serpent was used in divine rituals, including marriage. This was to ensure conception of children and to maintain health. Because again, remember, snakes renew themselves. They shed the old skin and they come out all new and shiny with a brand new skin. So they would use serpents in marriage ceremonies to help with the conception of children and to maintain health. Serpents were also considered wise and sources of knowledge, and so they were used in divination. The Hebrew word for serpent, nahas, connotes divination. The verb nahas means to practice divination or observe omens and signs. So which is probably why the serpent is connected to the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden myth. So you have the tree itself of knowledge and good and evil, and then you have the serpent, which would have been considered a symbol of wisdom or knowledge. And when a serpent was dispensing knowledge, it was usually depicted in an upright or erect form. So if you look at Pharaoh's headdress, there's usually an erect serpent up there. Uh, Moses' staff uses that symbolism as well, the serpent erect up on the staff. And Asclepius's staff, which is the symbol for medical care in modern day, it's a rough hewn branch with an upright serpent wound around it. And whenever you look at the art from, you know, the Garden of Eden, that's what we see. We see usually the serpent wound around the tree in an upright position. Asherah was known as the serpent lady or the lady of life, which comes from the same Canaanite word as Eve's name, Hawa. Eve is punished at the end of the story for listening to the serpent, eating the fruit of knowledge from the sacred tree, and she'll have to give birth in pain for the remainder of her life. Whereas goddesses in the ancient Near East, their myths talked about them giving birth painlessly. In Genesis 4, Eve has to turn to the Lord, Yahweh, to help her become fertile and produce a son. So I want you to really think about this. You have God divorcing himself from everything that has to do with Asherah. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is considered not okay. They're told not to eat from it or they'll surely die. The tree of life is appropriated. It's taken by Yahweh and made his own. The garden itself is appropriated and taken by Yahweh. He created it, not the mother goddess. The serpent is considered Satan or an agent of evil in the creation story. And Eve, the embodiment of the goddess, like the representation of the divine feminine, the mother of all living, was her name, the mother of all living, like the goddess of gods, the mother of gods was Asherah's name, the mother of all living, the mother of the gods. And so when you have the goddess symbol being punished for eating fruit from the tree, for listening to the serpent, you have this really heavy symbolism that none of these things are righteous and God is divorcing himself from them. And now he is turning around the roles. He is the great creator. He is able to create and to birth things into existence without the help of a mother goddess. Eve is demoted simply to being human. She's not the mother of all living. She is having to ask for help from the divine masculine to conceive and give birth. Whereas before this, women would have gone to the divine feminine and done fertility rituals to seek help from the mother goddess. This was a reversal of the goddess power and function. Eve was even created from Adam in a reversal of mortal female roles. Man did not come from woman, 
as happens in the observable world. In the Old Testament, woman comes from man. So woman is taken out of the creation process completely. In Yahweh's garden, sacred tree veneration has been prohibited while Yahweh appropriates himself with the tree of life. The goddess at the end of the story has been discredited, both her symbols and her personification in Eve, and made subservient to man and Yahweh, and then is commanded to be forgotten. And by the end of the first five books of the Old Testament, Canaanite religion has been fully discredited and Yahweh has appropriated all the symbols and functions of the mother goddess. Now, as I'm reading this, this is like really heavy for me. I'm actually having a really hard time getting through all of this because on the one hand, I have deep empathy for the people writing this. They're doing the best with what they have. I understand that they're not in a good place, likely. I can understand that they're traumatized. And yet, by putting this level of patriarchy in the religious books of the day, we codified the superiority of men and the inferiority of women. Before... It was an idea that was floating around. It was the way it had been for a while, but there was no book we could point to and say, look, God made it this way. This is the right way for the world to be. And women, when they complained, when they said this isn't fair, when they tried to liberate themselves, men could point to the Bible and say, no, This is the way it was supposed to be. This is divine. There's something incredibly oppressive about pointing to God and saying, your oppression is warranted because God wants it that way. Because traumatized men who were going through their own crap wrote patriarchy into their holy books. The fact that patriarchy is there tells me this didn't come from God. Because there is no divine being from my perspective, and I am absolutely being biased here. This hurts. This hurts deeply. There is no God that would be worthy of worship for me that would ever see me as less than a man. That would ever want me to bow down to another human and view myself as less than them. The more work I've done to love and accept myself, the more bogus this seems to me that God could or would ever see me as anything less than fully worthy, fully capable, fully intelligent, and fully contributing to this world. And I think the reason I've taken the last two weeks, three weeks, to talk about this is because it's not true. The last 2,600 years, men and women both have pointed to this text and said, see, this is God. This is what God wants for you. This is who you are as a woman. This is who men are. This is your place. And we're going to be moving into talking about reclaiming our power as women, reclaiming our voice, shaking off some of these subconscious beliefs. But one of the most influential beliefs we have that I think we don't realize is lurking in our subconscious is that the world was created this way, that it's always been this way, that men were created stronger. 
and women were created weaker. And it is just not true. Archaeological evidence shows that women were hunters and warriors, as well as gatherers and mothers and nurturers. And men were fathers and gatherers, as well as warriors and hunters, before we became an agrarian society. Women were not made to be subject to men. Men were not made to be subject to women. We were made to be equal. We are all humans. We all have things to add. And I think it is incredibly difficult. There's a grief I feel when I look at how this collection of books, this collection of writings has been considered absolute truth, unquestionable truth. And because it's been considered unquestionable truth, we are still, to some extent, living our lives under the limited understanding of men, traumatized men, who lived 2,600 years ago. I don't know. What do you think? Is it empowering for you to view this as a group of people's best effort at trying to make sense of the world? Where we can take what works for us, what's beautiful, what's uplifting, and ditch the rest? Or does it work for you to consider it an infallible document? I'd love to have that discussion with you this week. Does it make sense for you to look at the book and the writings in it and say, this was somebody's best effort. Let me get curious with it. What grains of wisdom can I pull from it? And what really doesn't serve me? Doesn't serve society? Doesn't serve humanity? Can we release those things or update those things? Because I think if we did, we would release a lot of the inequality today for all marginalized groups. When we quit pointing to the Bible as God's infallible word, there is no leg to stand on for inequality in the sexes, inequality in the races, inequality in the ethnic groups. Inequality between religious groups, LGBTQ hate, there is no leg to stand on. So many of the heated discussions I've gotten into with people who believe that there is a division amongst the races, amongst the sexes, amongst the abled and disabled body and amongst straight and LGBTQ people, so much of it comes back to that's what the Bible says. And this episode, I guess, I really want to challenge that. Even if that's what the Bible says, does it matter? Or was it written by other messy, traumatized humans like you and me? I think that's what I want to know this week. Let me know what you think. I can't wait to hear what you'll say. And we will begin to talk about stepping up and releasing the chains of patriarchy individually this upcoming week. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday.